Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the panel on applied AI. And uh, we are uh, fortunate to have an esteemed set of colleagues here on the, on the panel. And they will share with us the, their views about uh, applied AI. And as you know, great panelists uh, make great discussions. I'm not a panelist, I'm just the moderator. I'm the shepherd of this, uh, of this uh, 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 panel. So let, let me introduce uh, myself and, and the panelists uh, uh, for the next few minutes. I'm uh, Ari Kaufman. I'm the uh, Distinguished Professor of Computer Science and Chief Scientist of CWIT here at Stony Brook University. Um, I'm also the Site Director of the NSF Industry University Cooperative Research Center for Visual and Decision Informatics. That's how Applied AI was called uh, five years ago, uh, uh, um, decision informatics today. And uh, I guess uh, it's already a few years that we call it AI. Um, I served as uh, chair of computer science for 18 years. So I'm familiar with the area of, uh, of uh, that uh, we are discussing today. I've also conducted research for many decades in uh, visualization, uh, VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality, medical imaging, and of course, machine, machine learning. And specifically, I'm proud to say that I've been using, I've been uh, uh, conducting research in the applications of all of these, uh, all of these areas. And uh, you can read uh, my work in more than 350 uh, papers that I wrote, uh, uh, 20 invited keynotes. I filed or awarded more than 100 uh, uh, US and international patents. And uh, I've, I've, I've been a PI, a principal investigator or co-PI in, co on 130 research grants. Um, I'm a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, fellow of IEEE, fellow of ACM, and uh, also member of the European Academy of Sciences. I'm recipient of the IEEE Visualization Career Award. I'm a member of the inducted into the IEEE Visualization Academy and the Long Island Technology Hall of Fame. Um, I received my PhD in computer science in Ben Gurion University in Israel many, many years ago. This is myself. Uh, let me introduce uh, the panelists. Um, I'll start with uh, Nicole uh, uh, Treacock. She is the senior maverick at Zebra Technologies. She is focusing on future enterprise uh, AR and VR, and I'm excited to hear about uh, that specifically, and uh, some other emerging wearable technologies in the chief technology office of Zebra Technologies. She was previously charged, uh, uh, in charge of uh, Motorola Solutions headset uh, uh, computer program. And I, I suspect this is a continuation of that, uh, that uh, task. Before joining uh, uh, Symbol Technologies, uh, she was a member of the TSA Federal Task Force to protect the airlines. She worked uh, at Tiffany and company. She consulted through AT Kearney, and then she joined Symbol Technologies. We turned into Motorola Solutions, and Motorola Solutions turned into Zebra Technologies. She graduated top ranked from Northwestern University in 2002 with a master's in integrated marketing communication. And uh, before that, she got her bachelor degree in management and uh, and French uh, from RPI. So welcome, Nicole. 
The next panelist is Henry Chu. Uh, Henry received his uh, BSc and MSc degrees from University of Michigan and his PhD from Purdue University. Since 1988, he has been with the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, which is a beautiful place. I was there a couple of times. And uh, where he is uh, currently at, at, uh, at the university, he is a Lockheed Martin, Louisiana Board of Regent Professor of Computer Science and Computer Engineering. And he is also the Executive Director of the Informatics Research Institute. At the university, he leads the uh, 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 research in machine learning and data science. His current research, uh, his recent research has investigated problems related to collating and analyzing data from different sources to address such societal issues as improving health systems and disaster recovery planning. He leads a project that supports the data management and analytics needs of Louisiana Department of Health. And I've been collaborating with uh, Dr. Chu on, 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 on a new uh, industry university cooperative research center in applied AI. Maybe he will tell us more about it later on. Welcome, Henry, to the panel. The next uh, uh, panelist is Muli Narayanan. I uh, have been working with Muli for now uh, five years or so, and so I've, I know uh, Muli well. Uh, Muli is the founder and CEO of Ziblock Computational. He started uh, many companies and raised capital and developed strategic customer markets in the area of fintech, uh, financial technology, uh, digital health, and data center technologies. And he delivered on transformational technology, in, including IOTs and AI. I was actually saw so two of these uh, in, in action. In various series, senior technologies and, and in innovative roles at JP Morgan and Bursters, uh, he has delivered on the most extensive grid computing systems on Wall Street and award winning brokerage workstation technology, a global order and execution management technology that traded 4 billion notional daily, and a market-leading clearing platform integrating partners, on-prem and cloud technologies. His deep tech background spans high-performance computing, distributed enterprise computing, GPU acceleration, messaging system, cloud architecture, AI, and algorithms. So we are looking forward to hear more from Muli about, about these things. He published papers, hold a patent on enterprise messaging system, is an advisory board member in the NSF uh, uh, Center uh, for uh, Visual and, and the Decision Informatics, and an advisory board member on, uh, at Shenzhen IoT. He holds the Masters of science in computer science and engineering from Penn State. Muli, welcome to the, to the panel. Last but not least, uh, uh, Shi Chiang Wong. Uh, he is a research staff member of IBM Research um, at TJ Watson Research Center. Um, um, and he is working there on distributed AI. Uh, Shi Jiang uh, received his PhD from Imperial College in London in 2015. He is focusing currently on interdisciplinary areas in distributed computing, machine learning, networking, optimization, and signal processing. Uh, Dr. Wang received uh, the IEEE Communications Society Leonard Abraham Price in 2021, IBM Outstanding Technical Achievement Award in 2019 and 2021, Multiple Invention Achievement Award from IBM since 
2016 and best, pa best paper finalist of the IEEE International Conference on Image Processing in 2019 and best students paper award in 2015. Welcome, Shi Chiang, to the panel. Okay, so these are the panelists. As you can see, this is an esteemed set of uh, panelists. Um, a little bit about the logistics of this uh, panel. Uh, we, I'll give a short technical introduction uh, from my vantage point. Uh, and then each panelist will deliver their position statement uh, of five to 10 minutes or so and which I hope will set the tone for our conversation on this, on this panel. Then we will move to the Q&A uh, uh, portion. I will ask the panelists specific question and hopefully some of them will be controversial and will have some interesting discussion among, among the panelists. But uh, I'm also uh, or specifically encouraging the audience, you the listeners, to uh, send us your questions. So on the screen in front of you, on the, on the uh, top right hand side, there's a Q&A button. Please press on it and type in your uh, uh, question. So that's about the logistics. Uh, we have uh, about uh, an hour and an, and a half until uh, uh, approximately 10, uh, 15. At 10, 15, there will be a 15 minutes break. So please stay with us until the end of this, of this panel. So uh, just uh, a two minute uh, technical introduction. Um, as you know, uh, AI and specifically machine learning uh, becoming increasingly commonplace in many industries and in numerous applications. And that's what we kind of term applied AI. Maybe the panelists will disagree with me on, on the definition of applied AI. So let's see what, uh, what we get. So in my opinion, applied AI is where the rubber meets the road. It is already, um, as you know, uh, applied AI is already reforming or transforming businesses and society as a whole and it will rapidly become pervasive in all discipline. That's kind of my, my opinion. Again, if the panelists disagree, maybe it will be only in some of the disciplines. That's, that's, that's okay. Uh, this rapid adoption is driven by the strength of AI in task automation, which as you know, it can perceive, learn, decide and act independently. And that's due primarily to the data that is, uh, we are collecting as the gr ground truth, as we typically call it. And that's what gives it this uh, uh, strength of, of AI. And um, as you know, this uh, capturing the, the explicit or implicit knowledge uh, uh, through the data in, in a manner that is often much faster, more accurate and more objective than humans. We'll talk about humans also on this panel. I think this is very important. But uh, I believe in general that AI is more objective, more accurate and faster than, than human. So this brings uh, really new challenges and new opportunities to industry and the consumers in a variety of markets. And uh, I hope this panel will explore the area of applied AI, its challenges and its opportunities. Okay, um, so let's go now to, uh, to the panelist uh, statements and uh, we'll start uh, with Nicole. Nicole, are you ready for your position statement? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Let me try to share my slides.
Let me know when those slides appear if you can. Ari, are they good? Perfect, yes. Perfect, all right. Well, welcome and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Nicole Chakoukas, and I work in the Chief Technology Office for Zebra Technologies. Uh, the past, I would say a little bit over a decade, I've been focused on AR, VR, or XR, extended reality systems, as they relate to human interaction in the enterprise with applied machines. So specifically, aside from wrist or ring or body wearables, I focused on the head, looking at heads up display, head mounted display systems, and what does that mean for the future of work? I'm here today to share a little bit about why applied AI and the thinking of applied AI changed how we look at hardware design, applied uh, architectures, and what does it mean to help enable the future? We had to take a look and take a step back and look at human physiology. So Ari, I was really excited that you brought that up. And how do we behave in order to meet the expectations of the future? So in my research, they say the eyes are the windows to the soul. We look at heads up display computing or information at the point of activity in your point of view when you need it the most. So you could be a doctor doing surgery. You could be climbing up a, up a wind tunnel or um, trying to fix a complex piece of machinery with both of your hands. You could be picking up a package and putting it to its next location. What we see is what we do. And our eyes are actually a computational device that transmits information and logic to our brains to get processed. This understanding and this mechanism was really important for us to then figure out a way to present information to users, giving them tools of their trade, not necessarily a toy or something that you could buy online and play with your kids. So in this unique world of visual, contextual, rich information that doesn't overload the brain power of the user is basically where I spent a good bulk of my research since 2008. Um, I have a, a plethora of patents, about 10 patents, most of which are in this space. And a lot of what we do are applied realities because we want to get to a seamless environment. We want to get to a contextual and a, a, cog a conscious understanding of what we need to do next in order to do our jobs correctly. And what we learned was we had to take apart the shoebox on the head and really transmit and take a look at what ingredient technologies synthesize together to create a seamless experience that would not overload the user, be safe in regulated environments, understand OSHA standards, understand human physiology standards that protected the eyes over long-term use, protected the head against uh, microwave radiation, protected the person and created this tool for enterprise. So, with that notion and understanding, we had to take a step back and we took a look at what information was readily available. It's a couple of thousand pages. Thank you, NASA. Thank you, US Air Force. And then thank you, a whole bunch of others that put together a compendium that taught us what does the vision system look like for humans? What does the audio system for humans look like? And then thirdly, how do those systems come together that help influence the learning, the cognition, the understanding of the person. And this, this perspective really allowed our teams to take a step back and say, we're approaching the problem wrong. What would be a better way to present information in front of a user? And how does that information get translated, whether they're in a warehouse or whether they're outside on a field? And how does the placement of that information matter in relation to the outside environment? And how do you present that information properly where you're not stuck in a video game and you're not in this virtual world where you don't understand the hazards of a real job environment? So that's basically been the culmination of most of my work. So when we talk about sometimes applied AI at Zebra, it has to come back down to the ingredient technology level. What are you running things on? No one's at a short for creativity, but we want to take and understand the integrated systems approach. And that's what we've done. 
to share some of my research, to understand the drop down and, and why this is so important in human biological understanding. How do you create invisible borders? So here you see a drop down of an optic and you see the camera input in the direct line of sight in harmony with the environment. What this did in terms of our research is we learned that in order to bring this information to the user and to predict and put and to isolate alerts or information that um, you needed to see in the moment of time that was important, that you could not have a pixelated environment. And we learned that our eyes and our cognition has to be less than like 3.2 milliseconds. So we had to look at architectures that were less than sub a millisecond. So when you turn your head, the entire image moves with you in real time so that we didn't have a perceptible difference. And we also needed to understand that when we place an item like a cup in your field of view, that you can touch it in real time, that your virtual environment matched the real environment in a one-to-one -one relationship so that you didn't get a vertigo effect and then once this system and structure was in place, then we learned how do you annotate it? What information from either onboard sensors or infrastructure sensors would then really need to come back and translate to the user and how would that process? And how do you present information without overloading the person? So some of the research uh, that I was involved with helped lead this investigation and lead the study to understand really where the future would be headed. We take for granted that we can zoom in and zoom out. This is called segmentation. It is extremely difficult to do. So you could be driving your car and see your windshield. But the problem is the information on the road, the, the street signs are out in the distance. So similar to wearing an apparatus on the head, whether it be a head mounted display, whether it be see-through or mixed reality, in this case with cameras, we have to bring information and keep it in perspective, but yet annotate it on the object. And that is extremely difficult to do so that your eyes don't have to micro focus and constantly adjust. So bringing that information together to the user is really important. And again, you could be physically in an elevator shaft and there are dangers around you. So you had to have a pretty good understanding of the physical environment. Very difficult to do to have an onboarding system that transmits in technical digital information, digitizes back to the processing on the head while understanding all the biophysical characteristics of the eyes, the brain, making sure that you're not harming someone over long periods of time with technology. And then understanding what kinds of information transmit back to the cloud, how does it get processed, and how do we understand the lag time with that kind of uh, distance interaction. Contrast control, how do you present information in an intelligent way in an applied setting? Again, with not, without overburdening the person's brain while they understand where things are at. This was a culmination of my research it had us take a step back and understand how do we design for the person, for the environments that we're in, whether it be warehouse, transportation, logistics, healthcare, field service, in order to say, hey, it's a tool for the job, but we have to be mindful of the constraints of a human body, and then understand what information are we delivering in these various settings and how that gets presented to the user seamless so that they understand the whole extended reality system and experience, but also get the information at the points that they require. So here's another example. And then how do you transmit that back and understand how to get expert help and then facilitate real time conversations as well. Again, your hands free, you're at eye level, you're at your point of view and perspective. So I like this finish by saying what we have to do is understand how to connect our consciousness and how to really teach understanding and meaning in a lot of these new domains. And in order to do that, at least in my research, it was really important to understand the human body, where we're at, change the architecture and the infrastructure and change a little bit about how we design new things and then help that influence uh, where we want to go in terms of productization, commercialization and roadmaps. I will say that how we do this is very difficult, but the best three things that we do to iterate in a small circle 
is to understand our customers, our markets, and our technology at that intersection. And there's a lot of failure, which is okay. But over time, it helped us really inform our view as into what technologies are really going to be required and what technologies can stay in the consumer universe. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I look forward to the panel discussion. And uh, Ari, thank you very much for allowing me to present today. I look forward to questions as well. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole, for a very interesting uh, uh, statement. Um, so let's uh, let's move on. I'll, I'll come back with uh, some questions, but uh, let's move on now for the next presentation. And Henry, are you ready? Uh, you are you are muted. I am so sorry. Perfect. Perfect. I discovered that if I'm in the share mode, I cannot <laughs> unmute myself. Uh, I have a very short presentation. Uh, let me start that now. So I'm going to um, echo what Ari said earlier. Um, and that is um, CBDI among uh, a lot of industries and organizations have tamed the uh, data is everywhere challenges, right? So we now have a lot of data. Um, with the data, um, AI has grown um, to become, now we say AI is everywhere. Um, so it, with AI and machine learning, it brings new challenges and opportunities. And um, I've learned a lot from Ari, so I don't think we are going to be in a lot of disagreement in the sense that applied AI, I believe, is uh, is a very important uh, next step. Um, so Ari uh, pointed out that um, we've collaborated a lot uh, over many years on the Center for Visual and Decision Informatics, which in many ways is what applied AI was called, um, for, let's say, five years ago. And um, over this year, we have a lot of discussion on how do we uh, continue our work on the Center for Visual and Decision Informatics. And um, this spring, we made a decision that we should um, launch a new center. And the center is called Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence. And um, we have a proposal pending at NSF. and. Um, um, have my fingers crossed and all of that, hoping that uh, it, it will uh, become reality. And I believe that it will become reality uh, very soon. Um, it's a collaboration uh, between UL Lafayette, Stony Brook University, UNC Charlotte, and Tampere University. So these are uh, our, we have worked together for many years on uh, CBDI. And uh, with CAAI, we also have a uh, potential new academic partner in Tulane University, which uh, joined um, uh, by submitting a planning grant uh, for uh, the CAI. The vision is for the CAI to become a world leader in forging revolutionary breakthroughs and successful partnerships between academia, industry, and government in the applied AI domain. Um, Similar to the last slide that Nico showed, I think we are uh, in agreement that uh, we, we we work best by um, uh, collab collaborating with the industry um, to look at um, the customer, the technology, and uh, to 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 innovate. And um, being universities, uh, of course, we also uh, place an emphasis on student training in AI and its applications. So there are many uh, projects in, um, pro proposed in applied AI in, in, in the center. Um, I, mean, I will not go into a lot of details about any of those projects, but um, in my p personal uh, research, what we do is um, investigate particular architectures and then dive into the architecture to see um, what is actually going on in, in the, uh, let's say, a deep learning network. Um, one goal is to look at um, explainable AI, and that is how does a uh, decision was made and how uh, what, 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 what supported it. And um, in that line of work, we um, look at the contribution of each of the um, underlying links. Um, we also take the same approach and uh, go and look at um, 
time series prediction um, using recurrent networks, and uh, we, we are looking at a transformer-based um, uh, recurrent network um, to look at with a particular w window come as, as input, and then we look at the, um, because we are doing a sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, prediction, uh, what is the, um, is there a, a positional bias in the uh, um, horizon? So quickly and in five seconds, trivializing the problem. In time series prediction, you, you read in a, a, a window and then you try to predict a horizon. Um, usually in the, in, the, in the smallest horizon would be you take in, let's say, five time steps and predict one time step. But with uh, the sequence to sequence uh, prediction, you can actually read in um, six samples and try to predict 12 samples in, 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 into, into the future. And this is taken from a lot of the technologies is from the uh, natural language processing where you can translate a sentence into a sentence, right? You don't, you don't translate one word at a time. So the, 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 what, the problem that we are investigating is, is there a positional bias in, the, in terms of the uh, accuracy in the positions in the, um, in the predicted horizon? And we have some reasonably exciting uh, results that uh, we came up with recently. So I, would very, um, I don't think I would dive into a lot of details on, on this particular work that, I, that I'm reporting. Uh, but it's in the same um, idea of investigating, looking into, once you have trained a network, looking into the um, architecture and looking at how, how, how does the architecture affect the performance of the, of, of the deep learning network. And the motivation of this is um, images and signals can be um, attacked um, um, and, comp the, and the decision will be compromised. So in, in, in the lower left of, the, uh, of this pseudo-electronic poster, you see that um, if, there's an, the, if the authentic input is a stop sign, picture of a stop sign, and the network was trained to, to um, classify this as this is a stop sign, then everything goes well. There are a lot of attacks that can be, um, in, by, can be done by injecting noise into the data that makes the picture perceptibly not different from the clean picture to a human, and yet it will fool the decision-making uh, uh, deep learning network into thinking that it's a different picture. And um, if it um, got fooled into thinking that it's a yield sign, um, clearly that kind of errors can be disastrous. So it's no longer just funny in uh, faking a, 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 a system to think that um, a school bus is a panda, right? So it, it, these, these have serious um, consequences. So one way is to look at is, okay, how, how, how did this system get fooled? And um, that's part of the um, explainable AI. And the other way is looking at, okay, if we know that it was fooled, just exactly how was it fooled? And so we come up with a solution, um, and that is um, actually cha changing the um, the loss function in when you train the network. Um, so we it, it basically is um, a bunch of math equations. Uh, so we restrict the invariance and the covariance of data representation in deep learning uh, network. Um, we have some pilot results, um, and this is a way of uh, showing it that in the next to last layer of the deep learning network. Um, on, on the left is uh, a plain um, deep learning network, and the on the right is uh, using, um, by applying a new loss function, we can uh, basically pull the, pull the classes apart, and there are 10 classes in this particular example. And you can see that by doing this, um, it's harder, much harder for uh, the um, adversary to perturb the picture to uh, fool the network. As, as a side benefit, it actually improves on the classification, right, by having a representation that pulls these uh, classes uh, apart. Um, I also have a longer term interest in looking at rewriting the, um, these loss functions that are not just agnostic to any other problems. And that is, um, if you look at computer vision um, for 
about 20 years, um, a lot of the work has gone into looking at understanding the 3D geometry um, uh, and in doing these, uh, the reasoning to, um, for example, if you take multiple images from different angles, how do you do the reconstruction in, um, in, in, into a 3D uh, uh, model? Deep learning can do very, very well in classification, is doing um, much better, uh, getting better and better in doing um, object detection in images. Um, how do we actually fold in the uh, 3D domain um, um, information so that it can actually do 3D reconstruction? And I believe the solution there is to um, uh, put in, incorporate a lot of that information into the uh, uh, loss function. Uh, so this is a um, a first step into tinkering with the loss function, um, and I think there's a lot more potential in this area. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Henry, for your statement, and uh, uh, we'll move to the next panelist. Uh, uh, Shi Chiang, are you ready? Uh, yes, sure. Okay, uh, you can share your screen. Okay, I hope you see my screen and hear me. Um, yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what uh, I'm calling here sustainable edge AI. Um, so basically, um, my group at IBM has been uh, focusing quite a lot on edge computing, AI, and machine learning these days. Um, so basically, um, one of the examples that we have um, of such a system is like, um, for example, you want to um, classify sounds in some sort of industrial environment. Um, for example, there are a lot of factories um, in many different places which have um, these kind of machines. And um, these machines may make different types of sounds depending on what it is doing. And it also depends on whether the machine is functioning uh, properly or not. Um, so what happens um, as of today is like, usually there's a human expert going into these machine rooms. They may uh, listen to the machines using their own ears or they may measure like the noise level of the machines and so on to determine whether the machine is in normal status or maybe um, some of them or some parts inside the machines need to be replaced. And that is um, really bad for the human ear and it's not very efficient because um, you can only have an expert going into those places once a while. So what we have developed here is sort of like um, um, a way to use machine learning models um, to detect whether the sound produced by the machines are normal or not. And uh, to do so, we have um, this kind of a sensor, which could be a tablet um, as a prototype or um, in more reality, maybe it will be a smaller device that is placed in this kind of environments. And um, basically, once you have this, um, we can um, use a model that's trained using the sound from the same or similar environments to classify whether um, the machines are producing uh, normal sounds, which would indicate that they are working normally, or otherwise there might be some malfunctioning. So the challenge in this kind of a system is um, sort of like, um, I mean, there, there are multiple challenges here. So one um, challenge is in a lot of these kind of environments, you don't have a very good internet connection. And uh, that's where this um, notion of edge computing comes in, where in this context, it would mean that you probably need to do a lot of classification operations locally on the device. Um, and um, another challenge also is like, um, you, you really don't have any data to start with, right? Because this is not like a regular kind of application. Um, for example, in a lot of commercial applications these days, maybe the companies already collect a lot of data that people um, to uh, the cloud service or whatever, as long as they allow um, the company to use um, some of the data, and of course, after some sort of um, anonymization to train models, then you basically have a good amount of data to start with. But in this kind of um, applications here, it's like we don't really have 
data to start with because there's no model, there's even no sensor in, in, in or no sound sensor at least in this kind of a system to start with. So how to collect label data, that's one of the challenge. And also um, similar to consumer applications, you have privacy constraints. And um, in this context, as I said before, you don't have good internet connection. You also have uh, bandwidth limitation. And also if you're talking about different machines that are either in the same site or maybe across different sites, then you are really talking about um, things that are sort of similar, but they are not exactly the same, right? So how do you train a model on one site and use it um, in another site, for example? And um, also the system would evolve over time. It's, it's sort of like um, if you have placed this kind of a sensor into the environment for um, some amount of time, then you would keep collecting new data and you would have to decide whether you want to use the data to refine your model or maybe um, you don't want to use the data, but um, um, to just throw the data away. I mean, in general, it's good to use some part of the data, but maybe using all the data won't be feasible either. And um, also there's a limited computation um, and communication capability of the devices themselves because these are small sensors. Um, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, some of the solutions that we have put into this kind of a system which um, addresses some of these challenges that we have. Um, I mean, a lot of these things are open problems. So we don't say that we fully address all the challenges, but there, there are some ideas that we put into this, um, which um, basically allowed us to build um, a, at least an initial prototype for this kind of a use case. So how to collect data, what we found is like, um, there, there are two things. One is the, uh, the algorithm itself that is important but um, the other aspect that is also very important in practice is um, the user interface because you would ultimately have humans to label the data and maybe the humans will place the sensors in different places into the environment as well. Um, so there's sort of this kind of uh, an interactive user interface where you can manage the sounds that you collect. And um, we also use um, some of these um, little bit advanced algorithms related to um, um, or the algorithms for learning or training models without uh, perfect data. Sort of um, sometimes you don't have label data and we can use semi-supervised or self-supervised learning approaches. And also active learning is basically when you have collected a lot of data, you would like to recommend some of them for a human expert to look at and to say whether this is, uh, for example, whether this sound is normal or not. So that's where active learning will be important here. Um, so then once we have the data, the data might be still stored in the local site, maybe not on the device itself, and maybe you have a local server because due to some privacy reasons, you may not want to share the data out of the server. So how to train a model with all the different um, uh, distributed data sets that's around there, but you cannot collect all the data into a central place. Um, so there are um, some approaches here, like um, of course, traditional approaches to store everything in a central location, but this may be infeasible due to privacy and connection issues. Um, there are some um, ways to subsample the data. Uh, hopefully that would remove some of the sensitivity in the data. And also we can use federated learning, which is basically a privacy preserving way to train models in a distributed setting without sharing the raw data. So once we have trained the models, then we also have to manage the data and models, right? Because um, if you have multiple sites like this, um, you have um, different kinds of um, sound clips in this context that are collected at different locations. And uh, you also have uh, probably multiple models that are sort of tailored to different environments. So how do you determine whether some models should be um, kept or deleted and the same for the data samples? Um, so there are some algorithms that are applicable here. So one is continual learning, which is basically saying if you connect new, uh, collect new data samples, you can uh, keep training the model, but I don't want the model to forget what I've learned before because I may apply the same model back to the old environment that I was using it before. And there are also some personalized learning methods, which is basically saying you want to have a global model, but you may want to personalize that to specific situations so that um, they are 
good in terms of both generalizability and also um, um, for the like like for the, to, to work well in the specific use case or the specific environment. Uh, and of course, there are efficiency issues, and we can use um, techniques such as model pooling or in the context of federated learning, there are also training efficiency issues, and there are ways to address these issues as well. Um, but those are just some initial kind of solutions as of today. So there are a lot of challenges ahead, like um, um, a lot of the technologies that I've talked about, like continual learning, federated learning, and even meta learning. Um, there are quite some open problems in these domains, including how to make them efficient, how to make them um, work well and um, producing models with good accuracies. And also um, in terms of the actual deployment of these systems, um, the problem is like um, there are lots of new algorithms in machine learning and AI that are being developed by various researchers these days. And some of them, they are more related to uh, applications, and some are others may be less related to applications. So if we have an industrial system, how to sort of absorb or, or, or leverage these new algorithms and um, integrating them into the framework fairly quickly, I think that is one other challenge in terms of project management and also um, in terms of the software engineering pipelines. And of course, the robustness of machine learning models, uh, including uh, interpretability, and um, also um, there are some uh, adversarial attacks. I think Henry mentioned that as well before. So these are some of the barriers that people would um, dare to use these kind of deep learning models in some of the use cases. For example, we've seen in medical applications that people prefer to use simple models because they are more interpretable. If you use deep learning models, sometimes you may make certain predictions, although you have a high likelihood that they are correct, but you might uh, give certain uh, very strange outputs that um, you cannot afford in this kind of uh, critical situation, such as in medical applications. And of course, uh, the connection between hardware and software, I think someone probably mentioned this as well. And also, um, if you really talk about the pipeline of machine learning systems, they are, would need some new software engineering principles as well, because sometimes the models may be unpredictable, as what we said before, and um, you may need to find ways to define the whole um, sort of engineering principle that, um, that you would like to use to integrate these models into a real system. So that's uh, mostly it, and um, thank you, and looking forward to further discussions afterwards. Thank you, uh, Shi Chiang. Uh, are you on mute, maybe? I, I don't hear you. I am. Okay. I, can, I can hear Ari. I can hear him. He's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Shi Chiang. Can you hear me now? I don't know. Yeah, it seems I don't hear anyone anymore, so maybe I have to reconnect. OK. So let's move uh, to the uh, next panelist, uh, Muli Narayanan, and Muli will uh, give him give us uh, his uh, position statement. Uh, sharing the screen uh, is working fine. Muli, the floor is yours. Fantastic, Ari. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the folks at Civit, Ari, Satya, Peter Donnelly for this opportunity to be part of the. Uh, uh, the panel today. Um, you can screen, see my screen, yeah? Sure, yes, perfect. Okay, so um, this morning I'm going to try and make a case um, that applied AI ML uh, in enterprises and in businesses uh, is really one of uh, ecosystem development. And, um, and, and that it is best handled uh, by creating a new class of uh, digital assets. And, and we like to think of it as uh, AI, you know, API. Um, if you think about the, uh, you know, digital transformation one dot cloud and what that did to businesses and enterprises. And if you think about circa 2010 um, APIs uh, as the uh, digital transformation 2.0, enterprises sitting on data, a thin layer of middleware, 
uh, that could be brought in to securely deliver the data uh, via you know APIs opened up new ecosystems, new partnerships, and new products uh, that could be brought to market. Uh, we think of uh, circa 2020s as uh, really um, you know digital transformation 3.0 as AI API. Um, you know, and an enterprise or a business starts out with an AI application, and very quickly uh, they seem to realize it's never about one algorithm or one point solution. Computer vision is so dramatically different from, you know, NLP voice processing um, and very different from, you know, augmented analytics, cognitive explainable AI, some of the things that, uh, you know, we just discussed. And, um, and, and there are literally thousands of independent software vendors across the globe that are solving these problems. Uh, the problem set very quickly becomes how do you, as an enterprise, how do you bring these different kinds of uh, capabilities uh, into a single platform uh, because, you know, these thousands of ISVs really develop a lot of their algorithms and capabilities in, in, a, in public cloud environments like Azure and AWS. Like, how do you really, you know, bring them and curate them as assets? And, you know, is it possible to create a concept of an AI app store, you know, for an enterprise from there? You can pick and then curate and release them as APIs, uh, which are then easily utilized internally. Uh, as well as by business partners. So that's what we focus on. So the problem set and the mission statement we have set for ourselves is to uh, really lower the cost per insight. Um, that, that's our yardstick. We are headquartered in uh, CWIT and um, uh, with a branch office in uh, New Jersey. Uh, a, a good uh, case study here, again, uh, going back to uh, uh, what uh, you know, uh, Dr. Wong was talking about before, um, you know, edge AI. Um, so if you think about a trillion, uh, so a, tr a trillion new devices are going to come by 2035, right? And these are, you know, a lot of them are cameras, edge devices, IoT sensors. So a dramatic, uh, you know, mushrooming. Uh, what that really means is that uh, there's going to be a need for millions of curbside or edge data centers. Uh, for low, la low latency inferencing and responses, uh, similar to what was just discussed in the uh, sustainable, uh, you know, edge AI use case. Uh, you cannot go back all the way to the cloud. It has to be responded, you know, garage uh, with, a, with a camera that needs to do license plate recognition has to very quickly respond, right? Things like that. So, and, and you combine that with 5G, we, we really think that there are going to be millions of curved data centers. And when you combine that with thousands of AI ISVs, independent software vendors that I talked about, it really becomes an ecosystem problem. So those who really want to solve the, you know, for the smart city initiatives, um, you know, autonomous vehicles, you know, so municipalities that are looking to, you know, bridge the digital divide um, and, and, and position their cities as uh, forward thinking and, you know, bringing public safety use cases like, you know, automatic, uh, you know, license plate recognition, jaywalking detection, gunshot detection, you know, uh, commercial real estate companies are very interested in this area as well because they have tenants and uh, tenants uh, have camera systems and that need responses, you know, in a low latency manner right across, uh, you know, from the street or from the building. Um, you know, telecom operators, clearly they are, uh, they are going through a big uh, change at the moment uh, to support these uh, changes a lot of the tower companies are putting uh, small data centers uh, where these tower locations are uh, located. But particularly what happens is that there are three broad categories of challenges. One is managing the ecosystem uh, because there are multiple hardware vendors involved, multiple hardware technologies, cloud service providers, edge operators, um, and, and it, you know, the the independent algorithm that was developed, which solves for a point problem uh, in a public cloud environment where it was developed, then fails to operate in such, a, such an environment. It's got to be re-engineered, and you're back to the drawing board in many cases. So lowering the cost per insight challenge is also linked to, you know, you know, is that a way to take a model and deliver it consistently as an API? Right? We believe there is an AI middleware gap there is also a big price performance gap. Um, a lot of model training happens on, uh, you know, expensive, uh, you know, perhaps NVIDIA type architecture. And, 
you know, there, there's an opportunity to run inference engines on low cost, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, Intel architecture and, um, and uh, that, that could save, uh, you know, a, a significant amount of money in how these solutions are delivered to market. And finally, from a deployment perspective, and this was again discussed in the context of, you know, other uh, software engineering challenges. We are looking at a world of multi-cloud and hybrid cloud when it comes to these type of deployments. Uh, configuration management is a huge issue with a lot of open source technologies. Uh, we know a ton of orchestration capabilities get utilized, including Kubernetes and you know, OpenStack and you know, compute virtualization, network virtualization, all that good stuff. But you know, configuration management, especially when you think about diverse hardware and such, it becomes a very complex problem. And what is really needed is an edge, uh, a cloud to edge ML DevOps. Um, ML DevOps is where you sort of manage the pipelines of different uh, model environments and, and then you promote them as inference engines, as uniquely labeled, um, you know, uh, capabilities. Uh, but then it has to be delivered not just in cloud environment, but in edge uh, data centers, these multi-axis edge compute data centers where other than power space and cooling and, and rack space, there's nothing else available, right? So that's where we are focused on. We haven't solved all the problems, but we are picking a lot of traction. So we look at, um, you know, our, our approach to market is what we call an AI microcloud that we run in public cloud environments, um, in multi-axis edge compute hubs, and all the way into, you know, curbside data centers. We think of kiosk as cur curbside data centers. And we enable creation of AI app stores and and delivery of uh, uh, the AI models from cloud to edge environment. So that's how we um, uh, we think about it. And plat, you know, we 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 try and make it fairly comprehensive in terms of the workflows. It's a model development training environment, or models can be imported and further optimized. We can discuss what optimization means. That's a whole world unto itself. Just to give a little more realistic use case, this is from our partner that we work with. Um, it's a kiosk company. They bring, you know, content to engage, and they have communication on top uh, of the uh, the device. Uh, then this goes by the curbside, and we are working um, now to uh, bring hyperconverged infrastructure into such an environment, and delivering, making this a curbside data center that can be outside a building you know, um, and downtown or in stadiums uh, to power smart city type use cases. So uh, we're working with, uh, you know, an Intel-led coalition uh, where the micro cloud becomes the glue that ties in all these different pieces together. Um, and, you know, we are working with a lot of AI, ISVs, independent software vendors, and, 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 and very clearly also interested in academic researchers who have point algorithms that are developed but can find very effective commercial avenues for you know, disseminating such models as API down into such an environment. And we are working on packaging uh, these things uh, with, through aggregator networks in our go-to-market you know, channel strategies. So again, the, so we think of uh, two-way certifications. One is the microcloud on the hardware so we can think of you know Dell, Cisco, HP, Supermicro, and a whole slew of uh, hardware manufacturers. And on the other end, uh, we uh, we integrate the uh, the independent software vendors into our marketplace um, and bring their capabilities as microservices into the environment, which can then be packaged, optimized, and released into the uh, into thousands of uh, endpoints uh, at the edge. The journey started uh, at uh, Stony Brook, so we are very grateful for where we uh, started. Um, the first very mi first microcloud was established uh, at CWIT. Our initial vision was to um, uh, use the smart cluster that uh, Ari and team uh, put together for the uh, computer visualization and make that a uh, a microcloud for model training um, and. Uh, uh, and and basically built out an entire ML DevOps platform, um, and and with a with a with the ability to do uh, you know hybrid cloud, into public cloud environments and so on, we got a good good traction. Um, you know we, uh, we we have more than 120 registered users. Um, we, we've done a press release and and also 
you know, COVID-19, uh, uh, you know, drug discovery, uh, uh, you know, happened uh, in the environment. Uh, we've executed a variety of use cases uh, in life sciences, uh, you know, healthcare, computer vision, segmentation type problem to, uh, uh, again, these are the researchers and students and faculty members who brought in workloads into the environment. Uh, interestingly, we supported high performance computing uh, because the uh, the environment has substantial number of GPUs and you know workloads that sort of uh, you know uh, you know is disseminated across you know uh, you know hundred plus GPUs was something that we accomplished um, and we are looking at you know adding more and more capabilities into this platform uh, again you know the ecosystem concept you know we working with Akai Kiru um, that's another company at Seawit uh, and bringing um, you know, uh, explainable AI into the platform. So when microcloud is available, you can launch workstations and start immediately. You know, you move, make it super easy to bring the data sets in and start applying uh, explainability to such constructs. Um, we also brought in, uh, you know, time series based analytics uh, that was also discussed. Uh, we can talk about that. And um, our really vision is to really make this a comprehensive enterprise uh, microcloud, verticalize it by industry. Uh, we are very focused now on what we call AI optimization as a service. So above and beyond an app store construct, AI as an API, we, we're talking, you know, um, optimization as a service. Uh, really, you know, can there be predictions? So when a model is uh, being trained, uh, there is a need to, you know, set some yardsticks as it relates to accuracy and you know, how quickly the prediction needs to be done. And, you know, could that be then, um, you know, could, could you predict the batch sizes that are necessary and then slug it out into an HPC type construct to get the results? So we're working very closely with Intel and MicroCloud also runs within uh, Intel lab environment today. And um, so that's what we do. And, um, you know, eager to, you know, get into this exciting conversation that we have. If you want to take Perfect. a picture, you know, the best way to get in contact with us is that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Muli, for your statement. And uh, uh, this concludes the uh, position statements from the uh, panel. Um, we are jumping uh, into the Q&A uh, um, portion of the panel. I, um, I want to start by encouraging the audience to go and click on the Q&A button and add their questions there. Otherwise, I will have to ask all the questions and that's not fair. So go ahead and, uh, and <clears throat> put your questions in. So as you uh, type in your questions, I will, I will uh, start with my question and uh, maybe, maybe I will start with the not so controversial <laughs> question. And um, we heard a lot about uh, different uh, uh, applications, uh, hardware design, XR, uh, um, AR, uh, image and data security, edge AI, API, App Store, Smart City, Retail, supply chains, autonomous uh, driving. So uh, my question is, uh, which, which application has the best chance? So give me uh, examples of hot application that are next to adopt AI and be successful. Or maybe you believe this is not going, this is not for exclusive application. This is going to be very pervasive. So AI is pervasive and it's going to be everywhere. Or do you have some really hot application that we will all get excited about? Who wants to jump in? <laughs> Nicole, you want to start? Sure, why not? So in my world, you know, we really need to focus on an application that's going to solve a problem. What's confusing to um, a large customer base, let's say the fortune, you know, 1000s is there's so much technology out there that they, they're very confused by it. There's no focus. It, how applied AI, especially as it relates to wearables, especially heads up computing in my space, 
where the most impact is, is not in the margin constrained retail universe, but it's more in the field services, the rough and tumble utilities, um, aircraft manufacturing, car manufacturing, people that really understand um, heavy industry and, he and kind of like dirty jobs. So in the manufacturing space, in the field, in the field mobility, field services space, there's really a high, um, there's really a high degree of interest and understanding how to apply some of these methods to reduce time spent in the field, uh, to reduce wasted energy, because they're really the businesses are being run by service level agreements. So in, in those spaces where you have people that are necessary to, to perform complex tasks, there's um, a, 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 a wanting to test uh, fundamental technologies to see how to reduce time, increase productivity and performance. And I think we see a lot of traction there. So I'll, I'll pause there and let others speak as well. Anyone else want to jump in? Muli, I see you. Yeah, I'll, yeah I, I, I will chime in here. So, so I, I do agree that uh, with Nicole that there is, uh, you know, industrial 4.0, you know, is, is exciting. And so we are already working with a uh, company out of Germany that does, uh, you know, chemicals and, uh, you know, it's used in body parts of the automobile and, you know, consumption pattern prediction and things like that. So that's a real use case that we are working on. Interestingly, like I pointed out, the ecosystem problem, what starts with, you know, consumption of chemicals becomes, okay, can we have a camera that looks at the, uh, the finish of the automobile body part to say, you know, the quality of what has been finished is good or not. Now you just went from, you know, explainable AI uh, for quality or consumption pattern as a time series prediction to computer vision problem, right? Um, you know, we, we, are, we are also working on uh, public safety type use cases in city of Austin in that Intel-led consortium, right? Um, so that there are some very, very interesting use cases coming up there. Um, uh, we are also working, uh, you know, again, you know, Intel is looking to consolidate, you know, hundreds of AI ISVs through the platform that we have, because, you know, what is needed to really scale this out is a playbook, right? Uh, you know, a place where you have, you, you can pick and choose, you know, get the, you know, like quick service restaurants, right? So there are algorithms that do, you know, how long the fries are sitting uh, before somebody, you know, picks it up. So is it soggy fries or fresh fries, right? They are implementing solutions like that, but they're also getting into sales forecasting. So, you know, how best these things are delivered to the edges is going to be, you know, a key determinant in how fast the adoption is going to be. How quickly you can lower the cost per insight is going to be a key determinant for adoption in these cases. So that's what we are seeing. So, you know, my take on this whole thing is we don't know. We don't know which use cases are going to be, you know, the fastest. Uh, we don't know, um, you know, which specific set of algorithms in which industry segment is going to be that killer application. So, you know, my message to the CIOs as I've been on the road is, you know, think about future proofing. Think about building your ecosystem. Think about building your digital assets. You know, the more you can consolidate and bring a variety of algorithms or have a mechanism by which you can bring multiple AI constructs and capabilities into a single platform and make it shareable, the higher likelihood of success. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, some agreement. <laughs> uh, anyone else uh, want to chime in? Shichia? Maybe I can. Yeah, maybe I can add to that. I think I, I, I certainly agree with uh, both uh, Nicole and Mori. I think a very interesting perspective. So I think something that I may want to add here is also like, um, if you talk about adoption, there are also legal challenges, especially um, um, like if you are going into, for example, the medical domain, or if you're going into um, some other um, domains um, where basically that, that's a bit more sensitive compared to um, um, others. I mean, it, it's, it's like, and, and also in these kind of use cases, there might need to be some more degree of human intervention. So the, the interaction between humans and the AI systems, I think that is probably really an interesting area to look at as well. 
Um, and also uh, maybe the other aspect is um, because we are talking about AI applications, um, it also depends on how we define AI, right? Because um, if you look at a lot of the definitions of AI, sometimes it could be defined as really broadly. Right? And in, in some sense, a lot of systems that we have today, they do have some capabilities of um, making decisions um, automatically um, uh, based on some computerized algorithms. And also a lot of systems, they do make certain types of predictions. For example, if you use a mobile phone, you may predict the next few words that you're going to type when you type the first few words and so on. Um, so do we call that AI or not? I think that's probably something else to consider as well. Um, I mean, in general, I think, um, I mean, my take on this is like, um, I think I, I would agree that AI would become more um, popular and, and probably finally going into all the different application areas that you could think of. But um, the, um, the actual sort of appearance of AI or the actual role that AI plays in different systems it will be probably different depending on the applications that you're talking about. Great. Uh, Henry, do you want to add to that? I think my take is um, for AI methods to be easily used or easily ad ad adopted and trusted in applications is there has to be a way of describing the data, right? Describing the quality of the data. Because right now, um, when someone is trying to use an AI um, solution on a particular problem, there are a lot of things out there. And um, it, it, it can be confusing and then we, you consult an expert and then that expert turns out will always recommend this the technique that that expert is very familiar with. And th there is no real, I, I compare it to the um, engineering signal processing solutions in, in, in olden days where there's a way of describing the data and uh, for, for this kind of, uh, some, some kind of characteristics. And it, it, it could be bandwidth, it could be, um, so how predictable is a particular sequence? I, I don't see a lot of um, emphasis on that. Um, you, you, you could publish a paper in, in, in the latest, um, greatest way to do a time series prediction, for instance. A lot of data can be formed into the time series prediction problem. Uh, if I feed you a random sequence, there's no way you could predict it, right? But there's no way also right now to say that I can't do this, or, or AI techniques cannot do this. Um, or, or if there's some way of uh, characterizing the data and saying that you need a recurrent network with four layers in 82 uh, recurrent units. There, there, there's, there, I think there's just a lack in um, data standards, if you will. And I, I think that is something that um, would be an important uh, um, area in applied AI. So is it uh, standardizing AI or this is an issue of trustworthy AI uh, with then we need a good explainable AI? I, I think it's not standardizing AI. Um, I'm working with a particular company and they are actually interested in developing some kind of data standard for internal to that company. Um, they, they want to do inspection. They want, so interestingly that their first question wasn't what kind of algorithm will work with, will, will work for our uh, problem. The, the, the first step that they, what they want to take is what is the standard of the data that we need to pr produce? And it's a chicken and egg uh, situation because without knowing the what the algorithm you're going to use, you can't really say that you need this kind of data quality to to uh, to, to to tackle that. Um, but it, I, I think it's um, it, it's a almost refreshing way to look at uh, the, a final problem, and that is look at your own data quality first. Um, so we identified there are actually three components, right? Um, how much and, and the other issue is how much data do you have? Um, if you if you have like uh, 200 pictures, uh, well, you're not going to develop a very complicated uh, classification scheme. So, how much data do you have? What is the quality of your data? And how much accuracy can you tolerate? And you can have two of three. Um, so we're actually looking at the um, how do you describe the quality of the data? So it's more standardizing the data rather rather than standardizing the uh, AI techniques. I see. Um... So I already mentioned the uh, trustworthy AI and 
So how do we get the end user to trust the AI application? Uh, and how do we go about explaining it, what we call explainable AI? Is that is that the consideration when you're building a product? Um, Shi Chiang, you want to start? Uh, well, I, I would I would say maybe again like it, it, it probably really depends on what kind of applications um, you're talking about, right? Um, I, I think in general, explainable AI, I agree, is very important, and also uh, being trustworthy again is is also. Uh, of uh, significance uh, as well. Um, but I mean, there are some applications, for example, predicting the next words that you want to type in in the mobile the keyboard of a mobile phone. Like in this kind of applications, maybe, uh, I mean, you can, you can tolerate some mistakes that a model makes, right? But what you cannot tolerate in that case is like, you cannot, for example, say, I. I write a few words like my social security number is something, and then it will automatically come up with someone else's social security number. Um, so, so those are um, probably, um, and, and that issue is more related to privacy. So maybe in that kind of a consumer domain, privacy would be sort of a bit more important compared to like explaining why did I ex uh, predict this word that you would type in. But of course, in other cases, um, there are, um, for example, in healthcare, for example, if you probably um, the model makes certain recommendations for the doctor, the doctor should, um, for example, try to use this kind of um, medicines and so on, or this kind of treatments. And so that, that is uh, very important um, for um, uh, being uh, explainable and interpretable. Right? And, and one of the major pushbacks that um, we've seen in some of these domains is like, because the doctors don't trust machine learning or AI models um, and uh, because they don't know why they make this prediction they cannot um, say that I want to try this kind of um, um, this, this kind of uh, medical procedure out on this patient because um, they cannot take the risk um, and I mean there, there are probably other use cases where the model outputs themselves are trying to predict or trying to explain what is going on in the physical environment and uh, maybe that is coming back to the, um, like the sound classification example that I was giving earlier, where the model itself is trying to say whether the machine is operating normally or not, or um, what kind of uh, operations the machine is currently carrying out and so on. Um, so yeah, I think I, I would say it uh, depends on the application, but in general, trustworthy and explainability is very important. And there are, of course, a lot of applications that would need these kind of capabilities. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, do you want to comment on that? I think, um, you know, I think where we all echo in agreement is trying to understand very precisely the, the focus of the problem for the customer, for the individual. What, what is not working, I think, in some of our research is this buckshot approach to understanding how things can apply. Um, I think that some of the things that we're looking at is to really drill down onto a specific customer application and try to understand what would work there. I have some experience um, looking at edge AI models uh, specifically, and it's really, really hard when you deal with someone the size of like Zebra and you look at some of our different kinds of types of customers, uh, an all-in-one type approach really does not work and from customer to customer, the business processes and the details are so dynamically different um, that sometimes you have to be almost like as a consultancy, like Lily had said, and try to find specifically what works for their business process in their workflow. So some of the work that we're trying to do is trying to take a look at some of the specific workflows, let's say for one or two types of archetype customers in an industry and see if that really does apply or magnify from there. Um, but it's very, very difficult. And I think we're really a long way from seeing how things can be applied um, in the next couple of years. Maybe in the next 10 years, things will get more mainstream uh, and people will make the investments that are required. But for right now, um, I think we're still in the trial and error mode. That's just my opinion. No, that, Thank that's you. great. Yeah, um, uh, re echoing what uh, Shi Chiang said, I, I've worked with, uh, with a lot of medical imaging and with doctors. 
And specifically, I was on an NIH panel with a lot of doctors. Every proposal that came in with AI, they rejected it. Oh, it's a black box. We don't understand it. So they indeed want to see some, some kind of, of uh, explainable system. Why did you say that this is cancer? And why do you, did you say that this is a progressing towards cancer? And they wanted some explanation. So uh, many applications definitely require, I, I would use the word require, explainable AI, and you need to get the trust of, of the users, the end users. So uh, some of you talked about uh, human, human uh, um, uh, in the loop, uh, definitely in XR, AR, uh, we have human in the loop. Uh, so is the human in the loop important? Maybe it is important for this explainable and trustworthy AI, or maybe in general, this is how models should work. We should have the user in the loop, for example, for um, uh, continuous training, as, as Shi Chiang said before. Uh, Shi Chiang, you want to take that? Human in the loop, is that uh, critical, important? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly a very important topic because ultimately, as uh, what we all said, um, all the algorithms and the AI models will be applied back into um, the real world where you have customers um, and, and, and a major portion, or, or well, the customers basically they are sort of formed by humans. Right? So the humans will be those who are consuming these kind of AI technologies and in many cases, they may provide different types of feedback to the AI algorithms and technologies as well. Of course, the, the, the form of feedback could be quite different. Maybe uh, in some cases, the humans could provide back um, uh, the, the label for data samples, for example. And in other cases, maybe the feedback is more indirect. For example, if you use someone's product and um, if you end up um, not liking it, maybe you'll just stop using it or maybe you will develop certain types of behaviors that um, sort of um, is, was influenced by your use of the product. I mean, I think um, when talking about human in the loop, maybe we have to consider both this kind of a direct human in the loop where um, you have a clear um, building block in this whole kind of a system where, where you have a human environment. But I think more importantly, maybe we should also be careful and take into account this kind of an indirect human in the loop, right? Um, the humans might behave or might like your product or not like your product, depending on what the algorithm is doing. So yeah, I, I think I agree that um, it's, it's, it's certainly very important to consider how humans interact with all these AI systems. Uh, do you agree, Nicole? <laughs> I suspect you I agree. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, human in the system you know where's the human is the human wearing the system in our case in enterprise a heads up display uh, a ring scanner um, a wrist wearable so maybe something on the body that's a different type of a look at the human in the system or is the human in the system actually looking at the mobile and interacting with that um, what we're what we're trying to understand is the way we operate as people, it has to be free and flowing. And some of the information that gets presented to us is really linear and very staccato. So some of the things that we're trying to understand is what's the minimal amount of information that has to be presented at the point that's needed. And operating in that thesis, it's very difficult to, across all these different kinds of use cases, say what's really needed, how do you present it? given the fact that you know there may be a need for a wireless transmission of information and then what is possible to do let's say on a device um it's really really hard because you have let's say in a, in a working setting you have a device that has to last a full shift or eight hours or maybe have one battery change and how much processing can you really do how much intelligence can you really provide what are you doing over extended period of time so um i think that depending on we like to look at user-centered design. We like to do journey maps around the people, around the applications, around their use cases. And then we try to bring in the technology that would match that. There is not one silver bullet for any of these industries. Um, everyone's processes are so different. 
I think where we are excited to see some um, delivery of like machine learning or tiny ML is for certain types of hardware, like integrated systems, whether it be earbuds, whether it be um, accessories that you talk into, whether it be some type of device on a mobile phone, what kind of processing can happen on the device versus off the cloud and what information can then transmit to the user in a really short burst, right? What could be quick and dirty as opposed that needs a lot of processing on the back end. So we're trying to understand what's more near term, what's more long term. Um, it, it is definitely a journey. It's, it is, there's no one, one answer for all these different types of environments. Great. Um, Henry, any comments on this? Um, I'll be brief. Uh, given that AI is, is, is existing within an environment with human beings, obviously it has to take into human into account. And since no user, no two users are the same, um, I think that is very, very important that um, the, the AI system um, allow that, um, uh, it, I shouldn't say allow that, it's built to uh, in, incorporate uh, a very wide uh, spectrum of users. Uh, so I, th I think this goes into the, um, do, you, do you build something with a, with, with a uh, known bias or, or, or implicit bias uh, because you make some assumptions about the users. So um, this actually, I think, moves into the ethical AI part, right? Um, how do you make sure that um, you don't make certain assumptions about a user and um, the different there there is a very very wide spectrum of different types of users? Great. Okay, we have a few more minutes to uh, wrap up the the uh, this panel. Uh, the The audience did not ask any questions, so I will ask the last question, and this is. Um, hopefully a simple one then. So the question is, how do we democratize AI? Right now we see this is only um, people with a computer science uh, degree, uh, experts in AI can develop AI models. Can we make it uh, more for public use, uh, other people, uh, data scientists can can just build the model and run it. Uh, any any engineer can incorporate AI in the in the product. I see uh, Nicole is smiling. So <laughs> it, it's, it's hard, hard to start to see some of these platforms, you know, get developed in order to try to do that. But and that's great. But then you get to what am I running it on? What does my environment look like? And, and right now it becomes very difficult um, to implement uh, the way I've seen it, you know, in commercial industry. So, um, you know, this would be a really good question. I know Muli has is having some technical challenges, but I think some of his approaches are really fascinating on how he's kind of connecting the dots and getting it to work. Um, I think he had mentioned he's trying to do it across platforms right. um, and get like a tool belt for, for the companies to kind of see what sticks and what what helps in a in like a small roundabout way. I thought that was a really clever approach for where the technology is right now. Uh, Henry? Um, so in over the summer, the um, the White House announced um, I believe it is called uh, the National AI Research Resource, and, and that goal was to democratize AI research. But that's, of course, for mainly for doing research, and I don't know that that was actually uh, developed for the industry. Um, so I, I think there's some kind of uh, some something similar to that would be uh, would be helpful for the industry as well. Shijiang, any any comment on that? Is IBM has a solution? Uh, well, we don't have a solution, but we do have a cloud offering like where you can play around with different kinds of machine learning techniques. If you have, um, if your applica application is to classify images, for example, you can send the images to the cloud and the cloud will give you the solution. You can tailor the models based on your own training data and so on. I mean, I think that kind of cloud-based solutions and of course you could um, potentially pull the things down from the cloud to the address cloud. I think those kind of pipelines are being developed by various companies, I think, including what Moni mentioned just now. 
Um, so I, I would say it's probably really this whole ecosystem that needs to grow, which would um, incorporate new algorithms, um, pushing that those new technologies and algorithms into these kind of platforms, which are more accessible by people from the general public. I think that is sort of the trend that we are seeing as of today, and that has to happen and, and continue into the future. Great, great. great, so, great. Uh, Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, but we uh, this is the end of the panel, actually. I, you came on, online uh, just for me to thank you. I want to thank... Uh, I'll just take uh, one, one minute there, Ari. So, because democratizing AI is like the mission statement of what we do, right? So I, I just want to add that. Uh, and Nicole, so, Nicole uh, echo that uh, for you. We, uh, sorry for the, you know, I don't know what happened there. But essentially, you know, it's a multidimensional question, right? We see the, the world of AI as a world of haves and the have nots, right? Most of the big public cloud providers, you know, are providing APIs and they're locking it into their public cloud environments, right? We think that that's a, that's a, that's a game that needs to change with more open architecture, with AI stuff running at the edges in, in, in a variety of uh, environments and just not, you know, not, not have that hegemony. The other angle is on the consumption side, you know, as it relates to users. I think there is a whole approach on the product side with, you know, uh, no code approach, low code approach for delivering, you know, AI capabilities. And we are, you know, we constantly think about that on the product angles, especially when you, you know, even, you know, data as a first class citizen that Henry was talking about, right? It's a, so we think of, you know, converting art to a science. Right. You know, can you do dimensionality reduction as step number one, followed by time series on the limited set now that it has more predictive power so you can, you know, do things faster and anybody can do it in a low code environment as opposed to highly specialized and skilled people doing it. I think those are the approaches that um, I believe will will see some results and we are at least definitely focused on those. Great. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Murli. And I'm happy you jumped in in the in the. Uh, 11th hour. Anyway, I want to thank the, this uh, distinguished panel uh, for, for a, a very interesting hour and a half. It was exciting and uh, informative. Uh, specifically, I want to, say, to thank Nicole, Henry, Shi Chiang, and Muli. And of course, I want to thank uh, all the participants and uh, Siwit and the organizers mm -hmm. for giving us such an interesting uh, conference. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes the panel. There are a 13 minutes uh, break now, and I invite you to come back in 13 minutes for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.